Theobald Wolftone said that the Bantry Bay invasion was the nearest English escape since the Spanish Armada. Now, it's not one of the rebellions mentioned by the 1916 leaders in the proclamation, but the truth is, if the Bantry Bay invasion had succeeded, if they had managed to land in Ireland in 1796, it probably had a greater chance of succeeding than any of the rebellions mentioned in the 1916 proclamation. It probably had a much better chance of succeeding than the 1916 rising itself. And that was because the British were caught completely by surprise. They were not expecting a French invasion in Ireland. They were not expecting a United Irish revolt in the country. And so, so many of the cities were undefended and they had no contingency plans. They were not prepared to defend them. And so what went wrong? Well, this is really about the great gamble of the Bantry Bay invasion. And what really went wrong was the weather. Uh, people referred to it as, you know, in the time of the Spanish Armada, as the Protestant wind saved England. Well, the Protestant wind saved England once again in 1796. So the plan for the rebellion was that they would leave, they would set out with 50 French ships in the middle of winter in December 1796, carrying 14 and a half thousand soldiers. They would make their way to Bantry Bay in the south of Ireland in Cork, land there, and from there move up and capture the cities of Limerick and Cork, and then march to Dublin. Now, there were 53,000 British soldiers in Ireland at this time, but 9,000 of them were fencibles, and they were seen as the weakest of the troops, not very well trained, not very well armed. 18,000 of them were Catholic, and Tone believed that these would defect and join the rebels. So that actually, and then if you had regular Catholics join in and members of the United Irishmen, well then the belief was that you would actually have a force that would match the British. Now, it's not entirely clear what would have happened after that. Would the French have moved on and invaded Britain? Would the British have sent a massive force over to Ireland so that Ireland would have become the scene of this mag gigantic conflict between the French and the British? Would Ireland have been destroyed then uh, in all of this, caught in the crossfire of all of this? It's not particularly clear. But certainly the gamble was setting out with this big fleet in the middle of winter to try and head off. Now, Tone had produced a lot of proclamations for the Irish people. Uh, he was put on a ship, not with uh, the French leaders, he was put on a ship with a lot of the majors. Now, the general who was given command of the land part of the invasion was the most up-and-coming French general of the 1790s. He was seen as the most talented French general of the time. He was seen as having the best tactics, the best strategy. He was the best fighter. He was seen as the person who would go on and have this brilliant career in French history. Now, what's his name? Well, it's not the name you might expect. It's not Napoleon Bonaparte. It's a man called Lazare Hoche. And the reason why you don't know more about him, uh, we'll find out at the end of this class. Because Hoche was the person who the French were putting all of their hopes were on. So he was on one of the crucial ships and he would lead the forces once they landed in Bantry. The problem is that lots of things went wrong. They did have bad weather to rely on when they were leaving the French ports. That meant that the British were caught by surprise. The British fleet that were blockading the ports didn't know what was happening. The trouble is the French fleet divided into two as they left the French ports. And as they divided, they weren't able to reform. Their naval commanders weren't very good. For some reason, they had put all their 14 admirals on the one ship and those admirals ended up losing track of the directions and they sailed off into the Atlantic. Half of the ships sailed off into the Atlantic, didn't rejoin with the rest of the force, including a ship with Hosh on it. So Hosh missed all of the invasion. And just to give you an aftermath of what happened to Hosh, when Hosh's ship eventually made its way back to, to France, it ended up uh, crashing into some rocks about a mile off the shore of France and sank. Uh, Hosh ended up swimming to safety, but he got pneumonia and he actually died in 1797. And his death then paved the way then for the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, but that's a different story. So there was incredible ineptitude on the French side. 
There was incredible ineptitude on the British side as well. They were caught by surprise, they didn't know what was happening, but incredible ineptitude on the French side. They lost half of their force. And the force that then did make it to Bantry Bay found when they arrived in Cork that Ireland was experiencing weather that they had never experienced before. It was described by one commander on the British side who was in, in, in Limerick at the time as being like a tropical hurricane. And the storms were so bad that the ships were not able to land. And though the tension mounted for Wolf Tone, because every day they didn't know whether the weather would ease up and so they would be able to land, or whether a British fleet would come in from behind, trapping them off, cutting off their escape route and blow them to bits. Whether the British army would arrive on shore with cannon and destroy them. So every day Wolf Tone woke up not knowing whether it would be the day of victory or the day when he would be killed, when they would all be destroyed. And so the tension mounted. And Wolf Tone wrote these brilliant memoirs where day by day accounts of what was going on. And uh, his mood swings are incredible. Some days, some mornings, he'd be full of energy and life. And he'd be looking at the French and he'd be saying, uh, look at them, look how great they are. They're relaxed, they're playing cards, they're telling jokes. The French are brilliant. You know, this is a proper soldier in action. But then by the afternoon, he'd be furious and he'd be all angry and he'd be saying, look at the French. They're laughing, they're playing cards. They don't care about the Irish. They don't care about Ireland. They're just treating it as if it's just one big holiday. And then the next day, he'd change his mind again. A woman was snuck on board the ship. Uh, and you wouldn't even believe this if it was in a movie, but yet, we know that it happened. One of the officers had recently got married and he didn't want to be separated from his wife. So he dressed her up as a French officer and she snuck on board. And it took them a few days before they realized that a woman was on board. And Wolf Tone writes about how the behavior of all the men changed instantly. They went from being drunken and loud and uh, telling rude jokes to suddenly all trying to impress her. They all kept trying to charm her. And Wolf Tone says, she wasn't even that good looking. She was a former prostitute before she married the soldier. But yet, they all tried to chat her up. They all tried to impress her. And the males all behaved very differently. But as the days mounted, the tension mounted on board those ships. And Wolf Tone began to think, will I ever get to see the shore of Ireland? And he talked about how, you know, he was curiously relaxed looking at the shore of Ireland. That he said it was, he thought he'd be more emotionally affected. He said it, it, was, it was a bit as, as if he was watching the shore of Japan. But then he added, but I don't love my country any the less for not having this romantic attachment to her. He said that he felt he was so near the shore that he could stretch out his hand and touch it. He said that he was so near that he could take a biscuit out and throw it onto the shore. And yet the storms were too great and the ships weren't able to make a landing. And Christmas Day came and still the tension was there and Wolf Tone wasn't able to land. And they didn't know what they would do. They didn't know how much the British knew. In fact, the British still didn't know what was going on. They thought the convoy had gone off uh, to Portugal. They thought the ships that had been sighted off the coast of Bantry, they thought they were a Dutch convoy of, of merchants and traders who were trying to land. So really, the British didn't know what was going on. But on board those ships, Wolf Tone and the French did not know that. And as the days went on, they realised this wasn't going to work. And eventually, after 10 days of trying to land, they had to decide to abort the mission and return home. And Wolf Tone was dejected. He was absolutely depressed. He wrote in his diary saying, that's it. I'm no longer an Irish man. I might as well become a French man now and regulate my conduct accordingly. He figured that was going to be uh, that in terms of an Irish invasion. And he said, you know, I seem to have had a lot of good luck. I keep avoiding the British at sea. You know, maybe uh, they're never going to catch me at sea. And such hubris as Thomas Bartlett, the great historian, has noted, would eventually result in his downfall. And on the way back, they ended up, uh, the, ship got, the ship that he was on got in a terrible storm and it looked like it was going to sink. And Wolf Tone didn't get up. He remained in his hammock because he said, if I die, I want to die showing that I had no fear, 
that I wasn't afraid that I was prepared to accept that it was a bit like that scene in The Godfather when Michael Corleone looks down at his hand and sees that it's not shaking well that's what it was like for Wolf Tone he remained in his hammock prepared to accept whatever came but the storm passed and the ship carried on and along the way they came across a British trading fl- ship it was a, a little sh- uh, a brig that was uh, carrying salt to Ireland and they were so furious they were so frustrated at not having had anyone to shoot upon they ended up sinking that ship and Wolf Tone made his way back that invasion then prompted the British to tighten up their security incredibly suddenly their blockades of the French ports increased but also they began arming things incredibly in Ireland. They began clamping down on disaffection. They began rooting out anyone who they saw as suspicious. And that all paved the way in to the white terror that took place in 1797 and 1798, where they decided that they would use any means necessary to make sure that a French invasion did not happen and that the Irish would not rise up and support them. And as we'll see, uh, they used torture, they used rape, They used house burnings and beatings, an incredible reign of terror. Well, that was all sparked by knowing how close they had come in 1796 with Bantry Bay. And there was a follow up to it because one of Wolf Tone's earlier plans had been to launch an attack force into Bristol, which was the second city of Britain, and that they would just burn it to the ground and that this would strike a huge blow for the French war effort. And Wolf Tone did have some moral qualms about this. He thought, well, it will leave a lot of people without homes, it will reduce a lot of people to beggary, but then he thought, no, they deserve it. The British deserve it. I hate the name of England. I've hated her all my life. I'll hate her until my point of death. Wolf Tone was now very clearly an Irish separatist and he was prepared to do what was, what was necessary. The Bristol plan was not adopted, but in 1797, they decided to try it again. Now, the force did not go as far as Bristol. It ended up landing in Wales, but it actually caused, and it was a huge failure. Uh, The soldiers ended up getting drunk, Uh, the militia ended up counteracting it, but it caused a run on the banks in London. It actually caused uh, 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 a huge pressure on the British currency. It caused panic on the streets in England, which showed just how powerful it would have been if a, a French force had managed to land in Ireland and then make its way to Britain. For Wolf Tone's part though, he was bitterly disillusioned. All his planning had come to nothing. All his efforts had had failed. But he was still persuasive. And he told the French, we are not defeated. We failed here. The weather stopped us, but we will try again. And so they began planning to start another revolution. And that became the 1798 rebellion. But at the same time, when the British were putting in place incredible counter-revolutionary measures to terrify the Irish population into submission. We'll never know what would have happened, what might have happened if the French had landed in Bantry Bay in 1796. However, we do know that the British officers who were in command of Cork and Limerick said that they would not have defended the cities. They did not have enough men They did not have enough fortifications. They said if they had been faced with a superior French force, they would have abandoned those cities and retreated to Dublin. So we know for a fact that Munster, the southern counties, would have fallen to the French. The big issue then is how much of the rest of the country would have risen up in support of this invasion? How much of the Catholic militia would have defected and joined these revolutionaries? So it was the great gamble It was a gamble that failed and it was the blow that could have knocked Britain out of the war with France and created the Irish Republic, but in the end it failed. But I want to end by just reading something from Patrick Pearce because Patrick Pearce idolised Theobald Wolfe Tone and this is a speech that Patrick Pearce delivered at Bodenstown in County Kildare. It's the grave site of Theobald Wolfe Tone and it's a speech he delivered on the 22nd of June 1913 so shortly before the 1916 rising and it's a speech that I think shows the importance of Wolfe Tone in Irish Republican memory the inspiration that he gave to the future generations because Tone began we have come to the holiest place in Ireland holier to us even than the place where Patrick sleeps in Down Patrick brought us life but this man died for us. 
and though many before him and some since have died in testimony of the truth of Ireland's claim to nationhood, Wolfe Tone was the greatest of all that have made that testimony, the greatest of all that have died for Ireland, whether in old time or in new. He was the greatest of Irish nationalists. I believe that he was the greatest of Irish men. Thank you.